Well, welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson, and uh, it's always um, an interesting time when we get into the subject of apologetics at any level or any way, shape, or form. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a book entitled uh, Darwin's Doubt, uh, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design, authored by Dr. Stephen Meyer. He is the director of the uh, Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture and the founder of the uh, Intelligent Design Movement. And uh, his books include uh, The Explosive Evolution, or excuse me, Explore Evolution, and uh, Darwinism, Design, and Public Education. And uh, really delighted to have him with us today. I know he's on a fast track and a heavy schedule. So uh, Dr. Meyer, nice to have you with us, my friend. Yeah, great to be with you, Perry. Thank you. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an idea what's different about this book from what you've done previously? Well, the, the first main book I did was called Signature in the Cell, and it was about the origin of the very first life, a question that Darwin himself didn't actually address. And uh, uh, in that book, I showed that there was uh, powerful evidence for intelligent design from the very foundation, at the very foundation of life, and even simple one-celled organisms. And I argued in that book that, the, in particular, the information required to build a living cell is uh, a powerful indicator of intelligent design precisely because of what we know from experience that it takes a mind to generate information whether we find information in uh, especially when we find it in a digital form um, and uh, the second book called darwin's doubt is about not the origin of the first um, living cell but the origin of the first animal life and that's a question that Darwin did address, but, but in the origin of species, he acknowledged that he was really unable to explain it because the, the first animal life appears in the fossil record in a, at a time period called the Cambrian. And uh, today we refer to that event as the Cambrian explosion because so many new forms of life arose so quickly. And in the book, I addressed that, the, the, the doubt that Darwin expressed about that, that, that event. And then I, I trace that. I tell the story of that doubt and what's become of it in the ensuing 150 years. And I show that it's become really a profound mystery. It's, become, it's grown up to become illustrative of a major problem in evolutionary theory, the problem of the origin of biological form, and also the problem, of, again, of the origin of biological information. Because to build those new animals, you again need a great amount, uh, reams and reams, in fact, of mm -hmm. digital code and other forms of biological information. All right, let me just uh, encourage you. The, uh, I'm sure you can get the book right at Amazon and uh, Barnes & Noble. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, other online sellers. You can get it through my website by clicking on the, Amazon, on the, the online seller of your choice. Yeah, but uh, Barnes & Noble has also been featuring it in, uh, with uh, NCAP displays and in-store displays and things. So oh, good. It's, uh, Congra there. Congratulations. Uh, the Cambrian explosion, uh, I mean, it, it suggests that it just it happened. It popped into existence, uh, and you argue that. Well, from a, a geological point of view, what we would say is that it's a very abrupt appearance. It's geologically sudden. Uh, the main pulse of, uh, of the explosion uh, is about five to six million years as measured in the standard geologic time scale. Um, uh, that's geologically sudden, but it also turns out to be biologically sudden because the Darwinian mechanism has... Uh, calculable, uh, you, you, you can do the math, as it were, and, and determine how much change should likely occur in a given period of time. And when I say do the math, I'm talking about uh, equations that flow out of the Darwinian theory itself in a subdiscipline of neo-Darwinian theory called population genetics. If you know the mutation rate, the generation times, the size of populations, you can calculate how much evolutionary change should take place in a given period of time, or conversely, how long you would have to wait for a given change to occur. And when you make those calculations, and I describe those in the book, uh, it turns out that even very modest changes, uh, enough uh, change to produce a couple of coordinated mutations, will exceed, uh, vastly exceed, the amount of time available in the Cambrian explosion. Even five to ten million years is a blink of the eye biologically to say nothing of geologically. Wow. So what is the general consensus of the, uh, of the Cambridge explosion? Well, that it's a real problem. Uh, there are people on the, you know, on the Internet that the, the we've had a, a sort of a pile on of uh, aggressive anti, uh, of, of atheistic bloggers who have uh, tried to uh, 
review who have reviewed the book very negatively coming out of the shoot we had uh, some reviews uh within uh by three o'clock in the morning the night the book opened on june 18th which is i think kind of amusing actually but <laughs> the, uh the main the the main uh um people working on the Cambrian explosion in paleontology and evolutionary biology acknowledge that it's a major unsolved problem. And uh, there was a, 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 another important book about the Cambrian that came out this year by uh, James Valentine and Doug Irwin, two leading paleontologists. And uh, the book was recently reviewed in Science, and the first paragraph of the review said that the Cambrian is one of the, 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 the main and salient unsolved problems in evolutionary theory, and there's a good reason for that. It is the first appearance of, of animal life, and and yet it appear, appears so abruptly and requires so much, uh, in, uh, so such a large infusion of new genetic information that uh, really there's no no mechanism or, uh, to account for that uh, infusion of form and information. Uh, in your in your book, you say that the evolutionary biology is facing some kind of an engineering problem. What do you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> there are two mysteries associated with the Cambrian, and in Darwin's Doubt, I, I, I tell the story as a, as a mystery story. It's a, great, it's a great scientific mystery, and the first mystery is the mystery associated with the missing ancestral fossils. Uh, Darwin anticipated and, uh, that in the lower pre-Cambrian strata, there would be a series, a gradation of forms leading up to the Cambrian animals. Instead, they appear abruptly. He also expected that in the 150, well, in the years after his, the publication of The Origin, that eventually those missing forms would be found. They haven't been found, and what has been found are more Cambrian animals making the, the discontinuity, the abruptness of the appearance even more stark because each of those new Cambrian forms has in turn la uh, lacked a, a pre-Cambrian ancestor. So the, the explosion has become, from our point of view, even more explosive. But there's a, a second and more profound mystery, and that's the mystery of how you build an animal. That's the engineering problem. Uh, how would the neo-Darwinian mechanism, relying as it does on unguided, undirected, uh, natural processes, in particular the, the process of random mutation, generate all the information, all the instructions that are necessary to build those animals. Hmm. We know from our own experience of computer code that if you start randomly changing the zeros and ones in a section of uh, functional computer pr uh, software, you're likely to degrade that information rather than generate a new operating system or program. And it turns out that the same thing is true in life, that random mutations will inevitably end up destroying the information that you have long before you get some new set of instructions for building something fundamentally new. And so what we've learned about the importance, the centrality of digital information, of instructions encoded in DNA and, and, uh, and biological information generally to the construction and maintenance of life have created a profound mystery surrounding the, the Cambrian. It's a, wow. In a sense, the Cambrian explosion is an information explosion, and I ask in the book, where does that information come from? What's this doing to academia? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, the book's only out a month, but <laughs> I would ar actually argue that the problems that I've been, that I address in the book uh, have been well known to people in evolutionary biology for some time. And one of the things I do in the book that's, uh, that's kind of new is that I, I, I examine the six or so post neo-Darwinian evolutionary theories that are being formulated. Mm. Uh, you, if you listen to the standard commentators on evolution, you, you get the idea that all is well in the house of Darwin. And yet, within evolutionary biology itself, you find that there are major doubts being raised about the theory. The, the mechanism of natural selection and random mutation in particular has come in for considerable expressions of skepticism, and many evolutionary biologists themselves are now calling for or, or working on new theories of evolution because they recognize that the standard textbook theory is not adequate and the mechanism of natural selection and random mutation in particular does not have the creative power that has long been uh, attributed to it. So it's, I, I, I think it's fair to say there is a crisis in evolutionary biology and you see that in the proliferation mm. of new mm. theories attempting to solve these problems. Do you think there'll ever be uh, at least the opportunity to insert intelligent design as equal opportunity or is it still going to be uh, pretty much uh, kept out? Well, it depends on what you mean. Um, you know, right now we're not trying to get it into the schools. That creates the major political right. problems that are distracting from the scientific work that we're doing. But 
what we see happening is a is a uh, really rapid proliferation of interest in the perspective we're developing, uh, and I I say I would say by that I mean international interest. Right. We have a new journal called Biocomplexity. There's a distinguished editorial board. Scientists from around the world are contributing to the Intelligent Design Research Program. We have a lab here in Seattle, and uh, there's a uh, and, and the books and articles keep coming out of pace. So I think what happens in science is you really don't have a vote. What you have is, uh, it, well, in, a, in the formal sense, but you have scientists voting with their feet and becoming part of the research effort and, and scientists who are adopting the intelligent design perspective to guide their research as they, as they look at life That's differently. Great. That's great. Well, Dr. Meyer, I'm out of time, but uh, thanks. Let's stay in touch. This is fascinating. And how can thanks. people correspond yeah, with you? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the uh, Discovery Institute website, discovery.org. My uh, own website for the book is called darwinsdoubt.com. No apostrophe in Darwin, just darwinsdoubt.com. All right. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Let's stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah, right. thanks okay. for having me on. Oh, you bet. We'll be right back. <laughs> 